I feel really bad I can't talk to you about the power that Scientology has over Tom Cruise. But if you bear with me, I'm really going to talk about something I feel very passionately about. And really what I want to talk to you about tonight is, is about Latin America. And since the theme is power, I think that, this, uh, that Latin America has a great deal of unacknowledged power today, particularly uh, by us in the United States. So I'm going to start by telling you that what would you say if I could tell you I know where the happiest place on earth is? And the happiest place on earth is Colombia. Well, you might be a little bit surprised about that because after all, if you think about Colombia, you think about drugs, you think about guerrilla warfare, and yet there's something called the National Economic Foundation that takes a tally every year of the happiest places on the planet. And Colombia came in number one tied with Costa Rica and Vietnam. And it might surprise you, too, that two of the countries that are the happiest places on Earth are in Latin America, but it should not, because recently, the last decade or so, Latin America has been on quite a roll. And you can see that the income per person in Latin America over the last decade, or the last two decades, has, has more than doubled. And also, the amount of poverty in Latin America, if we could have the next slide. <laughs> nope, <laughs> that's OK. The amount of poverty in Latin America has declined from being half the population to about a third of the population. Now, the reason I myself got so interested in this is because, is because I became a Peace Corps volunteer at age 21, and I was assigned to Medellin, Colombia, and it really provided me with some of the happiest days of my life, and some of the seeds that were planted then really have continued um, up until today. And what one of the things that happened last year, I was involved with a project called PeaceCorpsPostcards.com, and we went around the world and found a lot of people uh, in the Peace Corps in different parts of the world, including Moroccan uh, hip hoppers working with a Peace Corps volunteer. Um, and then also people whose lives have been very much affected by the Peace Corps. So here is an example, a little bit of this from this video, of why I have remained so passionately devoted. back with a horse for me. They knocked on my door and brought me up the mountain for the first time. And they said, we want to build a school, and we need to figure out how to do it. With donated construction materials from the Coffee Growers Association, together they carved out a site on the side of a mountain and built the community's first school. It took us about a year to build the first two-classroom school. The people express their profound gratitude by naming the school Escuela Marina Orth. Even today, when I come up the mountain, I can barely get through it without starting to cry or my throat catches. It has such emotion for me. And as soon as I start climbing up here, I just my heart starts beating. For many years, when Medellin was the drug capital of the world, it was too dangerous for Maureen to visit the school she helped build. When she returned in 2004, she was asked by the Secretary of Education to help make Escuela Marina Orth the first bilingual public school in Colombia. He said, look, these kids aren't going to have a chance to compete in the world unless they know English and unless they know computers. Today, we are inaugurating the One Laptop Per Child project at our school, Marina Orth. A few years later, Escuela Marina Orth also became the first one laptop per child school in Colombia. You got it, you got it, 14. 
You did it! The computers have made a huge difference in these children's lives because for the first time they own something that they realize is extremely valuable, that is a tool for them to go so far beyond what they could have dreamed of. And as a result, they realize their own value more. And it, their parents are so excited to have this special tool in their house. Están ocupados ahí siempre aprendiendo. Igual uno aprende de ellos. Yo he aprendido mucho. Good morning. No es una de las mejores, es la mejor. Es una maravilla, lo mejor que hay acá. So it's really bringing the world, the entire world of the internet is being brought to this very isolated community high in the Andes and it's a huge transformation. ¿Y qué están aprendiendo? Huh? Sí. Muchas cosas. She's a, a great a great friend of Colombia and she comes to school very often and it's a great work that she, she has done. Today, the Marina Orth Foundation supports three schools with more than 1,200 students. I think, obviously, this school and these children and the ability to allow them to dream a life that they could never have imagined before, that's surely the most important thing I've ever done in my life, except having my son. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to be very old school with handwritten notes and glasses. Um, the one thing I think is very exciting about Latin America today is how fast it's really developing. And that village that you just saw in the video became the very first Wi-Fi village in all of Colombia. And today we have over 200 people on, uh, 200 families on Facebook. And sort of to carry the social media analogy further, there are now today more people who, who tune into the, the, uh, to the Twitter feed in Bogota than into New York City. But unfortunately, what really drives me crazy is all I ever hear all the time is China, 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 Africa, Africa, Africa. And even the best-selling book, One Half the Sky, uh, that's about to become a PBS series about women in the, in the developing world, there is not a single mention of any woman from Latin America as if they don't also hold up a significant portion of half the sky. And it just, I wish that the authors, Nicholas Kristoff and his wife, uh, Cheryl Wu Dunn, would come maybe to Medellin and they could see Paula Ortiz, the 14-year-old girl here from my school, who was flown to Montevideo because she was the only non-adult that took part in this big tech camp for technology educators from all over Latin America because she designed a project uh, of a video game. And then there are also the girls who are in, my, um, in one of our other schools in the robotics club where the girls actually outnumber the boys. But I don't want to give the girls all the credit because also we've got 11-year-old boys who can, hello, we have 11-year-old boys who can take apart computers and put them back together. And this, this boy, Juan David, has a 12-year-old brother named Christian. And Christian's dad came home one night, and he works in a factory, and said all the computers had broken down in the factory. And um, anyway, he said to the boss, well, listen, my, little, my son, my son can help you. So they said, well, bring him in. So they were just astounded because they were expecting somebody who was maybe 18 or 19 years old, but they got this 12-year-old kid. And so he actually did, he actually did repair the computers and he got paid for it. So we were very, we were very, very happy. And what I really wanted to say is that these kids are so um, eager to engage with the U.S. and I just wish the U.S. would return the eagerness to be engaged with kids like this and Latin America. If you think about it, all of Latin America exists in two of our own time zones and that means that if you even fly all the way down to Brazil, you're not going to be severely jet lagged. Latin Americans, we share the same Western values. It's a lot easier to learn Spanish and Portuguese than it is to learn Chinese. Um, 
The Hispanic voting block in this election has to be one of the most important, if not pivotal, voting blocks uh, to determine the outcome of the election. And yet, there's no national discussion whatsoever about Latinos, uh, Latin America, and what progress they're making, and what, what contributions uh, are being created now. And it's, if, if Latin America continues to grow for the next 10 years, at five, next 15 years, at 5%, um, at 5%, which, which is uh, for the next 10 years, they've grown for the last 15, for, excuse me, if they continue to grow, have you got the slide? Okay, well here, we'll go back to this. <laughs> Just a minute. Poverty, po if, they can, if they can continue to grow the same way for the next 15 years that they've grown for the last 10 years, poverty could drop from almost a third to only 10% of their entire population. That means that there, are, there will be a, a huge new emerging middle class that will want our goods and services. But once again, we are not seeming to connect to this potential power. I'll give you an example that doesn't blame our government. There are 2.1 million Hispanic businesses in the United States today, and they do an annual turnover of $350 billion annually. But only 1% of these businesses even bother to export to Latin America. Now, why is that? I think a great deal of the hesitancy to get involved with Latin America really deals with the issue of security. And concerns about security go both ways. If you poll people in the United States, it's all about jobs, jobs, jobs. But if you poll people in Latin America, they often mention crime, corruption, security as being one of their major concerns. Now, there is definitely a nexus between drugs and crime and violence and terrorism and insecurity. And this is where the US really, really will not take the blame. The United States refuses to accept responsibility for the consumption of drugs. We are the customers, but we don't take responsibility. Now, crime and violence and insecurity caused by drug traffickers is exploited all over the world by social inequality. But let's get a little bit real. Tonight's Friday night, you're at homecoming weekend. Cocaine is an upper, upper middle class drug. It, is, it thrives on campuses, particularly of academic and social elites who can afford to pay for it. But I think probably very few people while they're doing their care, carefree toots for the weekend, ever stop to consider how much global terrorism is funded by drugs, how many of our own troops, as well as untold thousands of civilians, are killed because of this. Don't forget, what is the number one export of Afghanistan? Drugs. How does it support? That's how you buy the guns. That's how you support the terrorists. So there are many things to think about. For example, Mexico assembles 66% of all blackberries made in this country. The direct involvement of Mexico's investment into the United States over the last five years has been more than $8 billion. But if you think about Mexico, what do you usually think about? Well, you think about drug wars or building a billion dollar fence to keep out illegal immigrants. But honestly, can we honestly ask ourselves, this is a, drugs are a multi-billion dollar industry. They have gone on for year after year after year for decades. Do you honestly think that that kind of a business can thrive because all the corruption is on the other side of the border? I think it's really time now to get serious about thinking about what to do um, about how to, how to to introduce or think about putting money towards finding alternative crops or rethinking how we're dealing with the drug war. Because meanwhile, despite all this, the reality of the emerging economies is so far beyond 
our assumptions and our expectations in Latin America. For example, Latin American foreign debt has declined from 28% in 1990 to 10% in 2010. They've faced up to their debt crisis, and guess who hasn't, right? Infant mortality is down by more than half. And the brain drain is actually changing direction and now going from north to south. Last year, Brazil had 32% more applications for workers, <clears throat> for foreign-born workers to work in Brazil and a lot of um, in, in uh, fields like engineering than they had the year before. And as you know, uh, China is the number one trading partner of Brazil. So according to the Inter-American Development Bank, in just one generation, there could be 500 million people in Latin America who will be emerging into the middle class. And they, will have, they won't just have um, aspirations for a, better, for a better income, but also for a better quality of life. And I think that we ought to be thinking of how we harness ourselves to that power. Now, that's why I think I'm so proud of those kids that you saw in the video um, that are at the schools with the laptops, because they're really trying to learn how to compete in the 21st century. And don't forget, the average age in Latin America is only 27. So I think it really boils down to the question is, are we going to be in a position to have a, a positive partnership in the future with Latin America? Or are we going to continue to ignore what is going on in our own backyard? You know, in the mid-19th century, there was a very famous axiom in an editorial, and it said, go west, young man. And I think that today, we ought to think about it in a different way and say, go south, young man and young woman. Gracias. Mm -hmm.